here's our audience. <laughs> I'm manually moving the camera. So that the next week, and the week following, we we'll have the short talk in English. And we need more people for next week because we're almost full for uh, this 20 seconds. Okay. So let's start. So it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Vivian Wild uh, from St. Andrews in uh, the United Kingdom. She obtained her uh, PhD uh, at the University of Cambridge and then uh, held several positions um, in Edinburgh, no, in uh, Edinburgh, Paris, uh, and uh, St. Uh So uh, before we start, I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, everyone, uh, the women, uh, here and Vivian for uh, the special day. So the floor is yours. Thank you for uh, giving the talk. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. Um, I had I hadn't actually spotted that I was speaking on International Women's Day. So there we go. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking to you about um, a sort of bringing together various aspects of the work that I've been doing over the last few years on what stops galaxies forming stars. Um, and this is work that I've done with many, many people and I've, I've tried to list them here and the ones that, and I'll, I'll, sh I'll credit them as you go through. So you'll see more of other people's work as well. Um, so hmm, that didn't move. Let's try again, there we go. It's moved, yeah. Um, so we're just going to start off with um, uh, Extra Galactic Astronomy 101 for anyone who is not an uh, extra galactic astronomer in the audience. Normally I do a hand poll and find out who that was, but I'm not sure with the little hands I'd actually be able to see. Um, so we we'll look at what the difference between star forming and, and quench galaxies um, and also discuss the difference between um, instantaneous and time integrated observations of galaxies. Um, and we'll look at how we have thought that red and dead quenched galaxies have formed, um, and then a little bit about uh, post-starburst galaxies, introduction to post-starburst galaxies, and how that's allowing us to step beyond the integrated or instantaneous measurements for galaxy um, formation evolution, um, and look at them as a, a potentially important formation mechanism for, for quiescent galaxies. And then we'll go through are they caused by mergers? What's their link with HGN? Will they stay quenched? And some aspects of, of simulations as well. So I hope that's all okay. Um, I can't see questions particularly as we go through, so um, save them up um, and I'll, I'll try and leave plenty of time for questions at the end. And if I start to run out of time, let me just note down what time it is, um, then uh, I might I might skip a, f a few bits so that we've had plenty of time for questions. Okay, so extra galactic astronomy 101 for anyone who's teaching first year, second year um, astrophysics uh, to, to students. If you look up in the night sky with a half decent telescope or pair of binoculars, it is possible to see galaxies external to ours. If you look at even, even better telescope, then you can see um, these uh, beautiful spiral galaxies and um, elliptical galaxies. Spiral galaxies being the ones that you tend to see um, on pictures in a newspaper and uh, in popular science magazines, but you hardly ever see pictures of, of red and dead galaxies because they're really pretty boring. The question that we ask as astronomers is why the different shapes, why the different kinematics, so the way that the stars are moving in these galaxies is different, why the different colours, what's their history, um, what's their future, why when you look at one galaxy um, on the sky, is it 
a spiral shape and and blue and 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 its next door neighbor can be uh, an elliptical shape and and pretty red so they, that's the sort of questions that we're we're trying to answer um we obviously know quite a lot about the answers to those questions um we've been doing this for a very long time um and this is probably where i start start most of the talks that i give to give you a, a background of sort of how galaxies evolve over time so if we look at the left hand um, plot we're looking at the star formation rate per unit co-moving megaparsec so per um, per unit volume um, as a function of of look back time to the start of the universe the start of the universe is on the right um, and present days on the left or we've got redshift as well if you prefer to look in in redshift units um, and these uh, measurements are coming from looking at galaxies at these redshifts and measuring their star formation rates. So these are instantaneous measurements made at all of these different redshifts. Um, and you can see uh, certainly between a redshift of zero and two, so that's about half the age of the universe, there's a lot of different surveys that have done this using lots of different indicators there's a lot of consistency between those different um, those different measurements um, and uh, it's very well understood that since half the age of the universe galaxies have been on average reducing their star formation rate um, by a factor of 10 so the total star formation rate density of the universe has dropped by a factor of 10. Before that time, this plot makes it look quite clean. It's not very clean. So in the high redshift universe, we're still very much discussing what where that slope is. Um, but really what I'm talking about is the latter half of, um, of, the, of cosmic time. On the right hand side, you've got the integrated property, right? So as the stars are formed, they form stellar mass and we can measure that stellar mass too. But that is an integrated property over the lifetime of the galaxy. So that's the key difference here. We've got instantaneous on the left and we've got these integrated properties on the right. Um, and so what we're looking at here is the um, total stellar mass density. So that's amount of stellar mass you added up in a, in a um, co-moving um, volume. And we're splitting it up here between star forming galaxies and quiescent galaxies. And the plot axes are flipped. Um, so the uh, start of the universe is on the left here and the present day is on the right. Um, so high redshift is on the left, and just zero on the right. And you can see here that um, the, both the star forming and the quiescent population, so this is the amount of mass of stars that are in star forming galaxies or in quiescent galaxies is building up with time. Now with star forming galaxies, that's obvious, right? Because the star forming galaxies can form stars and so their mass can increase. Um, and so you could naturally get that just from star formation happening in those galaxies, the mass is going to increase. Um, for quiescent galaxies, that's not obvious. And what this diagram tells us is that galaxies have to be transferring from the star forming sequence to quiescent galaxies. So they have to be quenching their star formation. They have to be switching off their star formation. Otherwise, we would never see this increase in the stellar mass density of quiescent galaxies because quiescent galaxies can't form stars themselves. Um, so this is reasonably well understood in terms of the simulations can reproduce this uh, sort of picture. Um, this is just one example, again, instantaneous on the left, integrated on the right, not quite the same um, same plot on the right, but it's, this, it's the same idea. So on the left, you've got the, the um, standard cosmic star formation rate in different simulations. And you can see that overall, many of the simulations reproduce um, the cosmic star formation rate evolution. Partly that's because they make sure that they do, because otherwise it wouldn't be a useful simulation. Um, so it's not necessarily predictive. Um, and then on the right, you can see uh, the quenched fraction. So that's the fraction of quenched galaxies in the universe as a function of time. And here you've got uh, dash dotted lines are, um, um, you've got a variety of different observations and, and simulations here. Um, so the, um, the 
basic point is that they 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 tend to agree. This one's a bit more difficult for the simulations, I'd say, to get this this quenched fraction. But they're doing it. And ten years ago, I wouldn't have been able to say that. And this is this is real progress in the simulations over the last decade. Um, here's another example, just to, to show you a different one. This is from Simba, which is one of the simulations that I have worked with. Um, and again, you're looking at the star formation rate density as a function of time on the left and uh, the fraction of quenched galaxies, uh, a fraction of galaxies as a function of specific star formation rate on the, on the right, um, with the dotted lines being the observations and the solid lines being um, the simulations. Um, and so, again, the simulations are doing, oh, they're not perfect, but they're doing a reasonable job of getting um, both star forming and quiescent or quenched galaxies in the simulations. Um, okay, so um, that's sort of the basic introduction to, to where we're at in terms of galaxy um, evolution. Um, and I want to look a little bit at um, this uh, this picture for how we might quench galaxies. So this is a, a really popular um, image that I see a lot still in conferences. This is from uh, Phil Hopkins in, in 2008. Um, and it was based on a, a small number of simulations, um, which uh, showed that if you collide um, SPH uh, disk galaxies, um, you can create ULEG style starbursts. And if you have a certain variety of, of supermassive black hole feedback and you eject all of the gas, then you can create post-starburst galaxies and eventually dead, red and dead elliptical looking things. So you're turning a star forming disk or two star forming disks in this case into dead um, elliptical, um, quiescent elliptical galaxies. And this has been a, a very popular, popular model for how you create quenched elliptical galaxies. Um, and so this is a, a, a blatant cultural um, plug here um, for anyone who's ever lived in the UK, right? We have this thing called Marmite, which is stuff that you put on toast. Most people in Brazil have never met this stuff, okay? It's thick and black and not really sweet. It's not really it's not bitter or it's just... It's just a sort of standard thing that we like for breakfast. But only about 50% of the British population likes it and the rest hate it. Um, most foreigners, to be honest, hate it. Um, and so the strap line for, for Marmite is uh, when, when they advertise it on TV is you either love it or you hate it, you know, which is an ad advert to get people to try it, I suppose. Um, and so I think this, this model for me is, is, is a little bit Marmite-like. Um, in the sense that you either love it or you, you really don't love it that much. Um, but it is certainly a bandwagon. This is absolutely an example of something that, you know, looks very plausible and it has all of these nice features and it brings together a lot of nice uh, observations and models. Um, and it explains something that, that we've wanted to explain for a long time. And so lots of people jump on it and uh, fit there paper introductions around this is how it is. And I'd like to uh, persuade you that this is not necessarily how it is. Um, and there's lots of questions that we have still about how this is actually operating when we look at the nitty gritty details. Um, so we're focusing on post starburst galaxies. So that's this things that are called K plus A's or E plus A's, depending on how you, how you look at them. But they're things that have had a recent burst of star formation and that burst has then subsequently quenched they've stopped forming stars um, so we're going to look at that in more detail and then we're going to go around the diagram and look at the different um, things that that should relate to post star burst if this picture is true um, so uh, sorry lost my train of thought um, When we look at um, simulations, um, there's lots and lots of different hydrodynamic simulations out there. These are the simulations that are used to, um, sorry, to um, explain 
how this process is happening, how you go from star forming galaxies to, to these quenched uh, ellipticals. Um, so there's uh, many uh, recipes that are used in these simulations. It's sort of nice to think that we, we're going from gas and we're forming stars and we're creating galaxies, but that's not what happens, right? We, we have gas, but it has a stellar mass of 10 to the five, 10 to the six stellar masses, and it's going to suddenly form a star. And that star isn't really a star, it's a population of stars. And because of the computational limitations of these simulations, you've got lots and lots of subgrid recipes that are put in underneath the hood of these simulations. And the, the result is that you, you can actually play around with all of these different knobs that you've got, all these things that you've got to tune, and you end up with something that looks in terms of this is the, the um, number of galaxies as a function of stellar mass, all these sim galaxies, all these simulations can sort of reproduce this, but then it's done in very different ways. And while that would be interesting, it's not, it, it's a bit of a problem, right? Because it means that in this diagram, so this diagram is, is simply the number of galaxies as a function of stellar mass. So we've just taken the stellar mass of galaxies and we've added them up. This is not sufficient information to constrain all of these subgrid recipes because we can just tune the model to get the right answer again. And so why look at post-starburst galaxies and why look at these interesting classes of galaxies? Because there's more information there. There's more information that we can use to knock out some of these recipes um, and, uh, and, 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 try to home in on which ones are more right than, than others. Um, and so this is possibly going to play. Yes, there we go. So this is a, an SPH simulation of a merging uh, galaxy system. It's actually set up to reproduce the mice, if anyone knows the mice merging system. but. Um, that's coincidental for this for this purpose. On the right, you can see the star formation rate as a function of time as that merger progresses. That's the total amount of stars formed in the cube. And then on the bottom, you see the optical stellar continuum. So that's the, the spectrum of the stars. And I'll go through that again, hopefully. Um, yep, there we go. So you can see as the galaxies um, have their first passage, you get a little blip, doesn't really do very much. Um, that's not always the case. It does depend on the physics of the of the simulation. Then as they coalesce, you get a big burst of star formation. The stellar continuum looks completely different. You get this strong UV light. And then as you go through the post-star burst phase, you get these really strong Balmer absorption lines, which is coming from the A and F stars becoming more visible over the O and B stars that have just gone supernova. Um, and then as it moves into the red sequence, you can see these strong calcium H and K lines um, and the, uh, I think you should be able to see my mouse over here, strong, these calcium H and K lines there. Um, and the Balmer absorption lines start to reduce. And so there's enormous amounts of information in just this bit of the optical continuum, um, rest frame optical continuum. It tells us about the balance of OB stars, AF stars, and lower mass stars, um, which allows us to reconstruct the recent star formation history of galaxies very, very accurately. We understand, to the level that we need to, we understand stellar evolution um, and how these, uh, these lines are produced. Um, and so that's what allows us to unpick an integrated spectrum and say, what was the past star formation history? So that's why this is beyond instantaneous or integrated. It's not an integrated property. Property We're unpicking the recent history of the galaxy in this way by using the stellar continuum. Um, so this is a recent example um, from work that I did um, a couple of years ago. Um, I don't know, for those of you that know me from 10, 15 years ago, I never bothered to fit stellar population models because I was never convinced that we could do it properly. Um, and I'm, I've come around to it. So um, I, I, I've now uh, come over to the, the dark side and I'm fitting stellar population models to get star formation histories out. Um, and here we've got an example using the bagpipes code, which is a, a fully Bayesian um, code. Uh, it fits both the photometry and the spectra at the same time. So here you're looking at the same rest frame um, 
rest frame optical spectrum, so this uh, 4,000 angstrom region, um, which has been shifted to the redshift of one up to about 8,000 angstroms. Uh, you can see the strong Balmer absorption lines. The blue is the is the data. It's reasonably noisy, but not not that bad for redshift one spectrum. Um, and the the model fits um, here are orange and, and black underneath. The reason there's two model fits here is that uh, in order to get the models to fit properly, um, we know that there's a bunch of systematics. And the systematics come from both the observational effects um, when we're taking a spectrum, so the spectrophotometry, but also um, from the, 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 the spectral synthesis models not being perfect. And so what we're doing here is we're using a Gaussian process noise module um, which allows for correlated errors. And that's what's so important when you're doing these, these fits. Um, we also, in this particular case, we know that the spectrograph has a, a, a spectrophotometric issue. So we're pinning down the spectrophotometry of the spectra onto the photometry, which is much more reliable. Um, and that's what this, this polynomial is in here. So in order to get realistic uh, star formation histories out, there's quite a lot of work that's that's required um, in order to take into account all of these different um, nuisance, nuisance effects. Um, but it it seems to work. Um, and these these galaxies were selected to be post-star burst galaxies, right? Because the, the, the post-star burst galaxies have really strong Balmer breaks. You can pick them up in photometry. You don't need to target them. A, 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 you don't need a blind survey in order to target these, these galaxies. Um, when we reconstruct their star formation histories, we find that lo and behold, the majority of them had recent bursts of star formation. What was surprising, perhaps, is the strength of these bursts um, and how rapidly they are quenching. So th these, these star bursts are uh, several hundred of solar masses per year. And this is redshift one. Um, and they're qu quenching rapidly with sort of half-life declines of, of 100 mega years or so. They're also building a very large fraction of the galaxy mass about 40 to 90 percent. There's a, always a possibility that this is a little bit overestimated. Despite not looking at the O and B stars, the A and F stars are still quite bright. And so they do, uh, certainly in this data where we don't have uh, long wavelength spectroscopy, so we don't have the red end of the spectroscopy, um, we don't have so much information on the lower mass stars. So, you know, treat this with caution, but still, the very, very significant bursts. When we look at these spectra, they effectively look like ANF star spectra. There's not a huge amount of, um, of stellar mass underneath that. So at redshift one, these are enormous bursts of stuff happening. Um, so this is an example at a redshift of zero instead, where we've taken um, manga observations and we've stacked all of the post-star burst spaxels in a predominantly post-star burst galaxy. So we've just made sure that we've made the cleanest post-star burst galaxy we possibly can. Um, and this has these have signal to noise ratios of 200 to 300. And this is where the GP noise, this Gaussian process noise really comes into play. Um, because when you fit a signal to noise ratio 200 to 300 spectrum to a uh, stellar population synthesis models, you find all of the problems in the stellar population synthesis models, as well as all the problems in your data spectrophotometry. Um, and what's really pleasing about this is that we can see patterns, right? So different galaxies, we can see the observed frame features coming through that we expect, and we can see the rest frame features coming through just, just being fitted with this Gaussian process noise modeling. Um, so this is what we can do at, at, at lower redshift. Um, and with this sort of signal to noise ratio, we can't just, it's not just the star formation histories that we can get out, um, but we can also look at the chemical evolution of these bursts. So we can measure the metallicity, not, it's not easy to measure metallicity of, of evolving metallicity of stars in, in an integrated spectrum. Um, but we, we're, we're pretty confident we can get two populations out. So we can get the average metallicity of the old population, the pre-burst population, and of the the burst population. And pretty much um, all of them, uh, there's a random sample, this, this sample is, is selected to show every everything, but the vast majority of them show a, a hike 
in um, stellar metallicity during that burst. To some extent, that's that's kind of what we'd expect um, in the sense that you, you're having many, many generations of star formation going on in these starbursts. They're extremely intense starbursts. Um, you don't have the time to expel that metal enriched gas before the next generation of stars is formed. And so you're really rapidly building up metals in these, in these objects. Um, but as far as we're aware, it's never actually directly been seen before. Um, and we can put this on the mass metallicity relation. Um, and so on the left hand side, you've got the pre burst metallicity um, versus stellar mass. And on the right hand side, you've got the post burst metallicity. So that's the metallicity of the stars in the star burst as a function of stellar mass. This is a diagram that those of you in extra galactic astronomy will see all the time, right? Mass metallicity relation is something that, that we use as a diagnostic for understanding how galaxies are forming their stars over time. Um, what's interesting is that star forming galaxies have a lower metallicity of, at a given stellar mass than quiescent galaxies, which it's sort of counter, it could be counterintuitive, depending on how you think, it's not obvious quite how you, how you get that relation. Um, but you can see here that the pre-burst metallicity, if you just look at the pink points um, in particular here, kind of hovering around where the star forming galaxies are sitting, which is what we expect. Because in, in order for these galaxies to have such a big star burst, they have to be star forming beforehand. They have to have lots of gas beforehand. We can't merge two quiescent galaxies and expect a big star burst because there isn't any gas in quiescent galaxies. So these are two star forming galaxies that are coming together, merging, producing a massive star burst. Um, and the, the metallicity of those star forming galaxies sits where we expect. They're just normal star forming galaxies. Um, during the burst, we have supersolar metallicities and it's not constrained right our models don't don't go up there so where where it sits is 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 not so clear but they're definitely very very high metallicities and then the last one is the mass weighted metallicity so if you take the whole galaxy and you say well what's the mass weighted metallicity which is what we do when we're calculating these plots for quiescent galaxies and you see they sit really nicely on the quiescent sequence. So what this is saying is that a single starburst is entirely sufficient to explain the difference in metallicity between star forming and quiescent galaxies at the same mass, which I think is, is pretty neat. So that's work that a PhD student of mine is doing and um, will come out uh, in the near future when his supervisor has time to read his paper drafts. Um, okay, so... Um, these are rare galaxies, post-starburst galaxies. They're pretty unusual. Um, but, and I think about 15 years ago when I started looking at the field, they were definitely just classed as an interesting curiosity. They, they'd be predominantly been found in clusters, um, which is not actually the case. They are, you know, if you look at most post-starbursts, they're in the field. But the cluster environment does have an effect, as I'll show you later. Um, so, what I think hadn't been realized is that they're a transient phenomenon. You don't see them for a very long period of time because the ANF stars go supernova and, and disappear, right? So you're only seeing them for a few hundred million years. Um, and this, this visibility time scale and means that despite the fact that they're rare, they're actually quite significant. There's quite a lot of them there. They're going off all the time. Um, and so what we did, this is using photometry actually, used, rather than using spectroscopy to, to identify them, but using multi-wavelength photometry right up to a redshift of 1.5, we can find post-starburst galaxies because of this really strong Balmer break and really distinctive spectral, spectral shape. Um, and this is the mass function of quiescent galaxies, so passive galaxies, which has this, this, this turnover that many of you will be familiar with, um, where... Um, this is redshift 1 to 1.5 and 0 0.5 to 1. And that, that turnover picks up at low redshifts. So you, we slowly build the lower mass, mass end of the, of the quiescent mass function. Um, and what you've got here on, in the orange is what happens if you take the quiescent mass function from the previous redshift bin, so the one that's, that's over on, on the right, and the post-starburst mass function, and you add them together, with a, an assumed visibility time scale for 
the post starbursts. And so you're saying, what happens if I take all the post starbursts at a redshift of, of 1.5 to 2, and I say they're all going to land on the quiescent, on the, on the passive mass function within a few hundred million years, does it then match the quiescent mass function in the next redshift bin down, right? Because it better had to, otherwise the, the post starbursts are not doing what what they should what we expect them to be doing and it does and it's spectacular right this is this is the predicted mass function from doing that process and you can see that it is really good and in order to get this this match we've we've fitted for this um visibility time scale and we've got you know, somewhere between 200 and, and 300 years um and if that was true then what this is saying is that the post starburst galaxies are accounting for a hundred percent of the growth of the quiescent population but it depends crucially on this visibility time um, and whether galaxies rejuvenate whether they go backwards and forwards between the two so that you know it, it's not as as pretty as as what i'm presenting here there's a there's a lot more work to be done in order to understand what this fraction actually is but it's just to say it's consistent with it, it could be the case that all of these things are uh, all quiescent galaxies are going through this this big post starburst this starburst post starburst phase i don't think many of us believe that 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 is actually the case but um it's at least shows that they're they're interesting things to study so coming back to this diagram and we're going to look at this one here so do these post starburst galaxies come from mergers and it's, it's actually not that easy to work that out um so some of them are but many are not um and it's never really been clear quite why many of the post starburst galaxies just appear to look normal they just they just look like sort of undisturbed disky elliptical-ish things um so this is sdss imaging um and obviously sdss isn't that deep these are all post starburst galaxies and you can see that some of them on your screen hopefully you'll be able to see that some of them have have some some tidal features so fairly um obvious post mergers um but many of them the others don't um this is updated. Oh, it's got the wrong year. This is 2020. Wilkinson et al. 2020. This is Scott Wilkinson in Canada, um, who's been working with Sarah Ellison on CFHTLS um, images um, of post starburst galaxies. And more of them show plausible um, plausible features, um, but it's, uh, it's still not all of them by a, by a long way. Um, and here we've got an example of... Uh, one particular object in SDSS and in CFHTLS, and you can see these features picking up uh, CFIS in um, here, where you can see, you know, there's very clearly something going on here. Um, whereas SDSS, there's clearly blobs, but you wouldn't necessarily know um, know what it was. Um, so, interestingly. Um, when we measure these things quantitatively using something called shape asymmetry, so that's just looking for asymmetries in the shape of the object, SDSS still does a really good job of this. And CFIS can miss things because uh, a lot of the features are, are circular. And so the, there's no shape asymmetry in it. Um, so it's not obvious that going to greater depths has has a huge benefit. The information is that we just need better ways of pulling it out, basically. Um, this is looking at um, a large number of galaxies uh, on a diagram which shows basically the 4000 angstrom break strength. So um, you've got old galaxies over here, old stellar populations here, young stellar populations on the left. Um, and here you're seeing the Balmer absorption. Um, this is an excess Balmer absorption. So these things at the top have got an excess of ANF stars in them. So that's where your post starbursts are sitting. And using the CFIS survey, um, we can see that um, these objects here at the edge of this distribution have a very high shape asymmetry. So their 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 images are uh, asymmetric. Not not when you not using flux, but just using the shapes of the of the images. Um, and this is interesting because if you have a starburst, then you go from your star forming galaxies to your starburst with weak 
um, bowel absorption. And then you climb up this edge to the post star burst galaxies, um, which uh, uh, have the strong A and F stars. And you can see this whole edge has, has a asymmetric uh, merger type features. Interestingly, you're using neural networks gives you a different answer. Uh, it depends on how you train your neural networks. These were specifically picked up, uh, trained to, to pick up um, post mergers. So things that had coalesced um, and that's only picking up the, the post starburst galaxies. But again, 35%, right? It's no by, by no means all of them. Um, you can look at this question the other way round. I'm going to skip that actually, um, and just keep keep moving. Otherwise, we're going to run out of time. There's also looking at the kinematics is interesting, right? So with Manga, we've got kinematic information, and my immediate reaction was, oh, kinematics will keep that information longer than than the images, and I'm, I'm becoming less and less convinced that that that's the case. And we've been using the radon transform, um, which is a way of looking at the changing kinematic position angle across the, the um, plane of the galaxy and depending on how, how much you're integrating over. Um, and uh, these are two examples of, of objects um, where this one here uh, has got a fairly standard, standard rotation, it doesn't nothing nothing much being shown this one here you can see a twist in the in the disk right so this is allowing us to look for kinematic distortions in in the galaxies and we can do this with the stellar population the problem with post starburst galaxies is they don't have really strong emission lines so you can't necessarily do it with strong emission lines um and there's a hint on this diagram it's a bit busy i'm afraid this is v over sigma as a function of r so that's the velocity rotation over the velocity dispersion as a function of the radius going out from the center of the galaxy out. Um, and if we just look at the red and the orange line, for example, so the red line um, are central post starburst galaxies. That's where the post starburst region is in the center of the galaxy. So classical post starburst galaxies. And you can see that V over sigma is, is lower than the control sample which suggests that they're more dispersion dominated than the control sample. Now, probably the devil is in the detail here as how you actually define your control sample. Um, so we're still, we're still working on this to try and really understand this. But it's a somewhat disappointing picture, whatever way you look at it, because if you pick apart um, your post starburst scan um, sample and your control samples, and you, you classify them based on their kinematic distortions, then the post starburst sample looks surprisingly similar to the control samples. Like you wouldn't normally expect this degree of, uh, of uh, similarity given the number of objects that we're looking at here, but there really, there's nothing there. There's absolutely no difference between the post starbursts in terms of their kinematic asymmetries that we can measure in manga, right? So there might be stuff that we, we're not picking up in manga. So that was a bit uh, frustrating, really, recently, um, and it uh, it doesn't really chime with what I was expecting to see um, from the simulations, certainly. So let's go and have a look at the simulations and see see what they're telling us here. And so this is a, a post merger mock manga cube made by uh, my one of my former PhD students, Ere Zeng. I don't know, some of you may know in St Andrews, we have a nasty habit of throwing buckets of water over our PhD students when they finish, preferably in the middle of winter, preferably as cold as possible. This is better than it what, what it used to be. We used to throw them in the pond, but the building manager didn't like this very much. So he bricked over our pond. Um, so we couldn't do that anymore. So that's why they get buckets of water. So this is this is Ive graduating, um, but he he created these 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 mock um, simulations of uh, of merging galaxies, post merging galaxies, um, to look at uh, the the post starburst features and whether we could could accurately reproduce them. And what we found is that with this this modern suite of SPH simulations, it's very similar to to the Eagle. Um, uh, SPH uh, Cosmo Hydro simulation. We could plausibly produce post starburst galaxies, but we had to have a one to one merger with very strong torque, so a, 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 an in plane merger, um, and, and we had to have some very strong expulsive feedback in order to expel the gas 
in order to get rid of the H alpha signature. So in galaxies, you see um, uh, hydrogen um, uh, al uh, hydrogen Bauma lines from star formation. Um, if you want to quench the galaxy, you don't see it anymore. Post starburst, you don't tend to see it. Um, but in simulations, if you've got any gas there, it will form stars. And so you get this H alpha signature. So you have to get rid of all of that gas. And that's where this case for strong explosive feedback has come from. Post starbursts are rare, but I don't believe they're that rare. I don't believe they're that rare that this is actually the case, especially in the local universe, right? We don't see strong explosive AGN feedback at that level blowing the gas out of the galaxies. So there's something fishy, and that's what we concluded in the paper. This, this isn't working as well as we thought it might do. Um, oh, why aren't you moving? There we go. And sure enough, when we look at the kinematics of uh, the simulations, um, this is uh, one of these radon transform diagrams of, a, a, um, of one of these major mergers. Um, and this is what the normal kinematics plot looks like that most of you are familiar with, right? So you've got a little bit of rotation going on, but really not very much. These merger simulations are brilliant at creating quiescent elliptical galaxies, right? That, that's, that's, that's what they've, they've been doing. That's their bread and butter. You look at the kinematics of these things and there's, there's very little there, right? Because it, this is where the radon transform is actually failing here and picking up the trace of, of where the, the kinematic position angle is going. And that's because it's just not rotating. The problem is that the post starburst that I showed you in the previous diagrams, the observations here, they very strongly rotate right these these are still rotating systems and they have they don't have mucked up radon transforms they've got patterns so that doesn't work if we look at the minor mergers in the simulations then we get patterns that look much more similar to what we're seeing in the post starburst galaxies in manga but here we've got a tension right because these things don't create post starburst features they don't have the strong enough feedback in order to get rid of all of the gas. Um, and they don't actually have the strong enough starburst. So they don't have strong enough torques to produce the really strong starburst that we are seeing in the manga galaxies. More work to be done, I think, is the conclusion here. It, the simulations are not matching the observations as well as we thought they were. OK, so are post-starburst galaxies caused by mergers? Mm, some of them are. but. I think the jury is out on, on how many. Um, okay, so this one's relatively easy. Can we link intense starbursts to post starbursts? Well, yes, I mean, reconstruct their star formation histories, we see very intense starbursts. But the other thing that we can do is we can look at their clustering. Um, so we look at the clustering of submillimeter galaxies and we compare it to the clustering of post starburst galaxies as a function of redshift and they match. Right, so it does look like submillimeter galaxies could plausibly turn into um, post-starburst galaxies and then into elliptical galaxies or quiescent galaxies at, at redshift zero. Um, so that's that's good. That's kind of what we'd expect. Um, everything is consistent in terms of the star formation histories and and where they might come from. So that's all fine. Um, what's their link to AGN? So. In the simulations, I'm saying we need to have this strong feedback. We need a way to get the gas out of the galaxies. Um, we've been looking at this for a while, and you know, there's some evidence, this is going back to, to 2007, 2010, um, that there's an excess of AGN in post starburst galaxies. That's true. These are narrow line AGN, not, not, not the um, type 1 AGN. And there does seem to be a peak up at about you know, a few hundred million years after the starburst, you start to see more AGN black hole accretion going on. So there's something there, there's something, but it's by no means the majority of the AGN feedback. And these things are, are not strong AGN by any means. These are these are type two piddling little things in, in Sloan. Um, so there's, there's something going on in the sense that there's probably gas sat around that's available for the AGN to accrete. Um, but certainly no strong evidence for for this expulsive AGN feedback that's required in order to get the gal the merger simulations to match. Um, we're working at the moment on on 
deconstructing the the quasar spectra to get really detailed um, galaxy spectra out from underneath. Um, this is working with a new PhD student um, and Paul Hewitt and um, in Cambridge who does uses a mean field ICA decomposition to to look in the really get really good quasar continua and you know, we can pull out the galaxy components in that way and by getting the spectra out rather than just doing this with photometry means we can access this star formation history that we're interested in this is work in progress you can see some problems with this if if you're an expert in the field you'll look at it and go, that's not right we know that's not right so we are working on it, it needs some refinement as another one so this one you can see has got a quiescent galaxy underneath um so the final piece in the picture, and I know I'm running out of time here, is will the post-starburst galaxies stay quenched? Are they going to turn into dead elliptical galaxies? This is a more difficult question to answer, right? Because we're now looking forward in time. Um, so we can look at the um, uh, we can look look at evidence for outflows. There is evidence for outflows. Um, they 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 flow. There's gas coming out of these things. Um, whether it fits in terms of the picture, the timing, um, what's causing that outflow is, is still not totally clear. I think that needs the, that needs more work with, with simulations. It's not clear this is massively different from a normal star forming galaxy either. Um, what is really puzzling about um, uh, post-starburst galaxies is that a lot of them still have cold gas. Um, so a lot of them have CO detections. Um, and it's not clear whether the mass of the gas is decreasing with post-starburst age. Um, the studies are, are still disagreeing on that. Um, so there's there's been some very detailed work um, by teams other than, than myself looking at uh, detailed observations of the gas in, in one to two objects. And there's sort of signs that it's turbulently heated and that's preventing it from forming stars. And of course, this this isn't implemented in the simulations, right? This additional sort of turbulent heating of the gas could prevent the galaxies from forming stars, but then presumably that is going to stop and then they're going to form more stars again in the future. But then these are already pretty much quiescent elliptical galaxies. So are they going to rejuvenate? Uh, there's, there's more, there's much more that needs to be to be answered there. Um, hmm. I think I'm going to leave this. Um, I'm going to finish with some some recent work, not done by myself or my team, um, but just something that I, I found quite interesting. This is a, a really neat measure, method called genetic modification, where you can take a simulation, take it apart, change the initial conditions again and put it back together. Um, and you build these sort of close twin simulations to really look at what's what's happening. And what they're concluding is that galaxy mergers are the things that are initiating quenching by, but it's a it's a um, slow process. So it's not that the galaxy merger happens and then the, blows the gas out and, and stops the um, the galaxy from forming stars, um, but you're unlocking some sort of AGN-driven transformation, which may be much more slow and, and uh, much more gradual than the old-fashioned picture that we have um, from the early 2000s. Okay, I'm going to finish there, because um, I know I'm out of time, um, to say rapidly quenched galaxies do exist they're potentially important um there's clearly some link to mergers but it doesn't seem to be one-to-one -one. if we go down the minor merger route that makes it much easier because minor mergers are much more difficult to pick up 600 million years for example after the merger happened um and certainly we've got problems with our isolated merger simulations that they're, they're, they're proving more and more difficult to to argue that that they're consistent with observations which is a shame because 10 years ago they were quite consistent with observations but that was at a much lower resolution um so there's some link to agn but again it's not one to one um and we're still trying to work out you know what what's what's doing the the quenching here so i think overall what stops a galaxy forming stars? We can say pretty much the same as we can say for much of extragalactic astronomy. It's complicated. Um, there's lots of different effects um, and there's lots more to be working on. Okay, so I think I will leave it there. Is that all right? Yeah. <laughs>